Jesus talked about his experience organizing a pilot uh, and getting that going. And I'd like to share with you some experiences we have at Dow Chemical moving from pilot to scaling up the, pi the pilot to the broader organization. At Dow, we have been actively pursuing enterprise manufacturing intelligence since 2012. Um, we were partnering with Northwest Analytics in this journey. And to date, we have 164 deployments in a variety of manufacturing environments. So how did we go from pilot to 164? What have we learned along the way? And how do we decide what we're going to do next? Our goal is we desire to have an operational guidance system. And um, that's how we like to think about this. We start with the data. As many of you have heard, you know, we all collect a lot of data. We might combine that with some of the models that we've got and knowledge that we've got squirreled away in everyone's heads, bring in the appropriate documentation, and all of these things together help provide a common language that we can use then for communication and collaboration. And then the goal is this system will elevate the data to be, become more visible so that we can make appropriate decisions and then take appropriate action. When you're preparing your organization for analytics, I think a key question to start with is understanding what decisions it is that you want to influence with the data that, that you're looking for. If you start with transactional types of decisions where you're looking at one variable at a time, that will mean a certain type of data. If you're looking for tactical course correction type of decisions or operational decisions across a plant or in uh, multiple units, then you'd be looking for a different types of data. As, again, if you're looking at strategic large-scale capital decisions, that would be a different type of data altogether. So my team has decided that we're playing in the tactical and operational range, and so that then um, pretty much dictates the type of data that we're looking at. So some of the things that we've learned along the way. Uh, you, there is no reorganization needed to get started. You can start with the model that you have today. You can read in the literature about a variety of different types of organizations to prepare your, organiza your organizational models to prepare your organization for analytics. And I think what this tells you is that there's no one organizational model that you must have. It's, uh, can, you can be successful with a variety of different models. What you do need, however, is high-level support. This is discussed in more detail in the book called Competing on Analytics by Davenport and Harris that I've referenced here. At Dow Chemical, one thing that we found to be very useful is we have what we think of as a client-facing team and a technology-facing team. So what, I mean by, what do I mean by that? The client-facing team works with our clients to take their data, their knowledge, understand what decisions they're trying to make, kind of give context to all of this. Then they work with the client to configure the tool using best practices that we've set out. So we want to have something that is similar across the organization. And then work with the client to define what we think of as operating discipline. Who, how are we using the tool? Who's maintaining it? When do we do what? That kind of thing. The client interfacing team is also responsible for training the client and providing uh, sort of level two type of troubleshooting as needed. The technology facing team we think of as providing the foundation for the system. So this team is responsible for uh, server installation, startup, they help manage our licenses, uh, any files that would be necessary on the system. This is not our IT organization, this is part of our, our uh, EMI team. Um, they are responsible for training the client interface team when we have new functionality, uh, setting best practices with the client interface team, training them on what the best practices should be, again, so we have sustainability across the organization. And then we also have an eye toward the growth of the technology. So we've been hearing a lot the past couple days about how it's not just the technology, there's a big culture change component piece to all of this, right? So one thing we've learned with the culture change component is that having a business-wide plan helps with the culture change buy-in. Across your business unit, if everyone's on a similar journey, maybe at different steps, but we're all in this journey together, that helps uh, improve buy-in along the way. And as Mike mentioned, 
Um, scalability is not the same as going from pilot to pilot. You can't just string pilots together and, and that's not the same as scaling. You need to uh, give some thought to that. And it's important to remember that not everything will go as planned. Learn to adjust and be more flexible. Um, like Voltaire said, the perfect is the enemy of the good. So it's important to be flexible along that way. One thing we uh, recently started was a company, what we think of as a company-wide steering team. And uh, we're bringing together um, representatives from a variety of functions across the company. Safety, security, supply chain, manufacturing, engineering, R&D, um, all these representatives from all these organizations uh, are participating on the same steering team. And one thing this does is helps to create a network of like-minded individuals across the company. It also helps provide a common language to communicate with each other and with all the, the people working on these uh, analytics programs. It provides motivation, um, it's a little bit of peer pressure maybe, if someone else is doing it, maybe I can too, uh, it, the good kind of peer pressure, but it helps, does provide motivation there. And it helps pull discrete activities together, which builds momentum for a variety of projects of different sizes. But the, think the most important thing is that it helps drive culture change across the organization. So it becomes clear that this isn't just the latest shiny thing. This really is a change in how we're going to do work across the organization. Recently, a friend of mine sent me uh, an interview, an article that was an interview with the Boeing CIO, and he said something that I thought was really interesting, so I wanted to share it today. He said, Analytics will take billions off the bottom line if you figure out how people across the organization can grasp the opportunity and how to democratize the capability. And I think having this company-wide steering team helps people figure out across the organization how they can grasp the opportunity. Uh, it's also important to note here that it's okay if the different teams are at different maturity levels on their analytics journey. And so what are we, I want to, spend a little bit of time talking about analytics maturity level. I think it's important, as Mike alluded to, to give some, spend some time thinking about what is your view of a mature analytics company. And I wanted to spend a little bit of time drawing your attention today to a couple of different analytics maturity models um, that we take a look at periodically. The first is from the book Analytics at Work by Davenport and Harris, and the second is the one in the white paper from ARC, um, that Mike shared. The white paper is Industrial Predictive Analytics and Machine Learning Planning Guide. <clears throat> There's a couple things here that I wanted to point out uh, in the, on the maturity level, uh, maturity model. The first is, as you can see, there's five levels. It's not a jump from we've got nothing to hey, we're there. So th it is a progression across uh, a variety of, of maturity levels. And as Mike pointed out, you know, maybe your goal isn't to make it to people are minimally involved in machine-driven behaviors. Maybe that's not appropriate for your organization. So it's important to give some thought to what level it is that you want to achieve. I also think it's important to realize that this isn't just technology. It encompasses people, processes, and things as well. This is the model from Analytics at Work. And they've organized their things a little bit differently, but uh, again, they have multiple stages. Now, these authors made the comment that um, God has decreed that all maturity levels have five levels. So maybe that's why there's five levels in all these things. But, and they have a little more granularity on their, um, what they call success factors. But again, you can see that we're, we're taking a look at people and processes and things. Now, one thing that my team has found to be educational here, um, we take a look at this maturity model uh, periodically. We did it uh, in January of 2016 or 2017, and then we did it again last month, and talk about, as a team, where we think the organization is on the maturity levels and what it is that we can do, what can we control, what can we affect to take, every, to take our organization to the next step. And, Taking a look at, think, talking about where we were last year, where we are this year, that was actually pretty motivational for people to understand that, yeah, we are on this journey, yeah, there is a lot of work, but you know, we are seeing progress. 
All right, so along the way, there will be speed bumps on your culture change journey. And uh, probably, I wanted to talk a little bit about that here. Probably the, the top two over here are the ones that we encounter the most. The, okay, that not invented here, why are you telling me this about this thing? And the, uh, oh, here comes another tool, I just have to wait a month and this will go away. Then we also encounter a little bit of they don't know what they don't know. So maybe they're meeting their goals, maybe they're meeting their financial targets, maybe they don't understand that they could do that more efficiently, more effectively with fewer resources. We also encounter a little bit of I don't want to pay for that. I have my financial goals, this isn't part of it, I'm not paying for it. And then uh, as Jesus kind of alluded to, we have a little bit of, hey, I have this tool I built, it's really cool, and if all we did was leverage it across the entire company, then, then you don't need, I don't need you, we can just do my thing. So how do we navigate some of these culture change speed bumps? One thing at Dow that we found that was really powerful is something we call the road test. Basically, it's a try before you buy kind of concept. So my team has licenses that we keep um, on hand ourselves and a special what we call road test server where if we have an interested client, we will work with them, configure the system uh, to their needs so it's something that they're interested, they're, they're willing and able to use, and then we let them test it out for about six months. At the end of six months, if they like it, and most of the time they do, then it's up to them to go ahead and purchase the licenses. If they don't like it, we take the licenses away, say thank you very much, and go on to the next client. As I mentioned before, a business-wide strategy is also very helpful for navigating those culture change speed bumps, as well as uh, testimonials from happy clients. We call these success stories, and we've generated a little template uh, for collecting the success stories in. So as we get a little bit down the analytics journey with our clients, if they come back to us and say, hey, wow, that was so powerful, that saved me two weeks worth of work, or I caught something going wrong four weeks earlier than I normally would have, and it saved me so much money, then that's what we call a success story, and we document that. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, we can use, and then we can use that later with uh, next the next client who might be interested in uh, our analytics. It's also important to realize that there is a culture change component in that, in this, and have the team become a little bit conversant in that. And this was mentioned in the previous session as well. And being able to articulate how anal analytics will change the client's lives, it can also be very powerful in navigating the culture change speed bumps. For example, if you can say, you know, I know that you do this thing where you're pulling data from all these different sources, and it takes you four hours a day to do it, but guess what? I can help you out with that, and it will save you three hours every morning. Then uh, usually people are ready to listen to the rest of what you have to say. All right. We went from pilot to our first 14 implementations, yay. Now what do we do? Where do we go next? Well, as I mentioned, happy clients are often repeat clients. So we have had several um, examples where someone said, you know that thing that you helped me with, uh, looking at my data, that was so awesome and so helpful. I have this different set of data, I have a different set of decisions I wanna make based on that data. Do you think you could help me in this new situation? So it's a, in a sense, it's, it's scope creep, but it's the good kind of scope creep. As I mentioned before, uh, happy clients have good testimonials. So sharing success stories with uh, new potential clients can help them visualize how they, where they might be um, with the use of analytics. And then helping a business-wide plan helps prioritize where to go next. So the, the business has their top 10 priorities and you kind of work your way through those. This also helps um, when you're talking about a value case. Regarding new technology, how do we decide what new technology comes next? We go back to the question of what outcome is it we're trying to achieve? Now we realize there is some, we don't know what we don't know still here in this, in this kind of gray space, but it's gotta come back to the outcome because that's where you build your business case. 
we also need to keep in mind how are we going to deploy and upgrade this? And Jesus talked about this in his presentation as well. What's the training communication plan going to look like if we're going to de deploy this uh, widely across the organization? And how are we going to resolve issues that the users have? Is this something where they have to call the vendor every time there's a problem? Because that's probably not going to work. And then we also need to consider if it's going to fit within the company architecture. And if not, what's it going to take to make it fit? And that tied together with the outcome, right? If the value isn't there, then maybe it's not worth trying to make it fit in your company architecture. Additionally, there are some forces external to the team that we have to keep in mind. For example, at Dow, the IT department is considering a data lake. So how is this going to affect the way we do trials and interact with our data? Because it's, it will. We need visioners and we need doers. The visioners are the people who help paint the picture of the future state. And then the doers are the people who work with us to determine whether it's ready for wide-scale deployment yet. Is it soup? Are we ready for prime time? So we have to keep both of those uh, groups of people uh, in communication. To try to look at new, assess new technology and deal with the, uh, what was it, 820 new, 850 vendors um, last year, we've uh, laid out some guidelines for dealing with vendors. The first is we want to bring technology to the company that's going to make money. What outcome do we seek? What's the problem that uh, we're trying to solve? What's the value of the problem? Is there an existing solution in-house? Maybe we have something, we just need to turn the function on. Maybe we aren't using it properly right now. Additionally, we would like the vendors to be able to, to be willing to explain what their offering is. We don't want to look at your code, but we do want to understand how the data is being treated. Is it going into a black box and an answer is spitting out? That's not acceptable. We want to understand how the data is being treated. And then, like Jesus mentioned, sustainability and scalability are, are also both of, of importance here. We don't want any one-hit wonders. Remember a few years ago uh, on the internet, Gungam Style was super popular. Everywhere you turned, you saw Gungam Style. That's a one-hit wonder. We're trying to avoid that. And then additionally, during the proof of concept stage, we want risk-taking to be shared by the vendor as well as Dow just while we get moving. All right, and as Mike alluded to, um, there is the shiny thing component. Um, say somebody in the E-suite watches Sunday morning television and they watch all those wonderful, glossy, shiny ads and commercials on television, and then Monday morning you walk into the office and you've got a million emails saying, ooh, we need to look at this and we need to try that. What do you do? We try to focus the conversation back on the problem. What is the objective here? What's the outcome that we're trying, we're, we're trying to seek? Do we have an existing solution in-house? Is there something we're already, we've already paying for? And then as you are build credi build, have successes, you can build credibility with the uh, E-suite as well. And this is another area where the success stories can come in handy. You share them um, not just with potential clients, but with higher level leaders as well. And once they see that what you're doing is bringing value to the company, you can build some credibility. Now at Dow, we've realized there is um, a need to have what we think of as a sandbox uh, environment. And so recently we've opened what we're calling the Digital Operations Center. Um, this area, this office, is chartered to help evaluate new technology. It's a little uh, sandbox area. We can bring technology into Dow and see how it plays within, with our Dow systems. It also helps us navigate the ITIS space in Dow. So not every group who has, uh, wants to do something in analytics on a particular type of data has to have an expert in the ITIS um, space. They, they don't have to know the lingo or the terminology, the right person to call. We just can call the Digital Operations Center and they help us navigate that space within Dow. 
They also uh, say abreast of new offerings in the market. And then they'll host showcases or workshops with um, DAO leaders so that folks can see what is available and maybe get some ideas about um, how we could use these things to bring value to the company. So we also have put together what we think of as best practices for selecting new technology. Um, and the first would be something that we call you know, proof of concept. Does this really work for us? Uh, and then uh, next would be um, architecture shaping. Can, can it play nicely within DAO? If the answers to both of those questions are positive, then maybe we would move on to a pilot stage. Is this really something we can see ourselves using? Or is it just kind of, yeah, that'd be really cool, but you know, we're not, nobody's gonna wanna use this thing. And then uh, back to the value statement, opportunity analysis. If we use it, is it gonna bring value? Or is it just kind of one of those one hit wonders that solves one problem once and then we're done? And uh, finally, we always, we need to keep consider deployment in making all these decisions. Can we deploy it in a planned, thoughtful manner across the company? All right, so why didn't we develop it, uh, analytics in-house? You might be thinking, hey, Dow Chemical, uh, yeah, you have a history of developing new technology, developing some software in-house. How come you didn't continue on that path in, in this case? We feel that the event horizon for software is, is much shorter than it is for physical assets. So we put physical assets in the ground. We want, let's say, conservatively 20 years out of it. Um, think about your computer, your operating system, your cell phone 20 years ago. It's changed an awful lot. We believe that there's too much potential for continually developing software in-house right now. And the bottom line is, Dow's not a software company. We want to make product, not software. So eventually, you'll be very successful scaling your fabulous analytics across the entire organization. Um, and this will result in you not being the driver anymore. It kind of takes on a, a life of its own. I just sent my youngest child off to college and in a sense, it's kind of the same way. You spend all this time uh, nurturing and growing and guiding and making decisions and at some point you've got to turn the whole thing loose. If you hold on too long, you will be your own source of failure. You, you can't put, your, put the fences around, around the uh, effort. However, we believe at Dow that the culture change, if effective and you do it ahead of time, will help ensure that there's continued progress in the direction of goodness. Um, so again, coming back to the culture change piece. And I'd just like to leave you with a few thoughts here. First of all, there will be culture change speed bumps, but they can be mitigated. It's a good idea to have a shiny thing plan because there will be a shiny thing um, distraction. An internal sandbox can be a very useful space for shaping concepts. Whoops, what happened? I don't know. Maybe we lost the outlet. Um, letting go at the appropriate time is important. And it's okay if different parts of the company are at different maturity levels. And with that, okay, that's my last slide. And thanks for your time, I appreciate it. Thank you.